Hi everyone, thanks for watching. For our latest Artemis Live video interview, I'm delighted to welcome back two senior executives from the specialist reinsurance and ILS fund investment manager, ELIS Capital Management. Joining me today are Dr. Pete Daly, head of research, and Frank Fisher, partner and chief analytics officer at the firm. Hello, both of you. Nice to see you again. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. So, Viewers may recall that we had Pete and Frank joining me back in November 2021, um, so almost six months ago now, and we interviewed the guys on the topic of the ELIS view on climate risk and climate change. So I thought fast forward roughly six months and, and ELIS has continued to put an extensive effort into climate risk related research and you have a new paper published recently about the influence of climate change on hurricanes. So with ELIS, a specialist reinsurance and retro investment manager and targeting largely property catastrophe exposure, climate risk and climate change are obviously key considerations. And so in this interview, we're going to get an update on the ELIS view of climate risk, how the research is going, and also how those efforts are influencing the company's ILS decision making too. So this time I thought perhaps we could leave off where we left the last interview and since November, Thought it'd be interesting to hear how have your discussions with investors around climate risk and climate change evolved frank yeah great and thanks for hosting us again steve um yeah it's really interesting to think back on the last interview in november because you might think well six months not much would have changed but uh certainly a lot a lot has happened since then you know back then we're on the heels of hurricane ida and obviously multiple active hurricane seasons and, and climate change is arguably the most talked about uh topic in the market and, and with our investors as well in the meetings. But obviously, as we all know, in the, in the past several months, we've seen a dramatic increase in inflation. We've seen a war in the Ukraine, stock market volatility around all of that. Uh, Fed fund rates, you know, likely going up, which, uh, you know, calls into question different levels of, uh, of return that are needed. So these have really become the leading topics of mind share amongst our investors. And, and interestingly enough, have kind of reminded people of the diversification benefit of ILS, um, mm -hmm. even as people knew it conceptually, they hadn't seen it in a while. Um, you know, to see ILS having a good first quarter um, when the rest of the world is, is a bit volatile. So, you know, on top of that, you know, in the insurance ecosystem itself, you know, we have the reduction of ILS capital, of course. You know, a bit of a flight away from CAT from traditional reinsurers, rating agency. Uh, you know, potential proposed changes, which you guys have covered on S and S and P and so forth. And finally, a Florida and Louisiana, you know, insurance landscape that is is quickly approaching a dire situation. So, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, of activity and, and change in that in that in that time. So, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that climate change has moved to the back burner. Uh, it definitely is not. Uh, but it's being it's sort of sharing the front burner with a lot more a lot more key issues that uh, people are looking at in the space. So. You know, it kind of goes along with the overall rightful concern of anyone looking into our space that you know wants to make good returns over time. Are we pricing the risk correctly for for a lot of this? You know, particularly inflation uh, is a key issue. That's that's a, probably the number one question we get. Are you keeping up with inflation? Are you pricing that correctly? So, you know, while it, it kind of reminds us that while climate change, uh, you know, which may be somewhat of a gradual impact, you know, we can have shocks to the system that the insurance industry needs to handle as well. That are, that are not related to that. So, um, but I don't wanna ignore your original question. So, you know, on, on climate change specifically, I think what we're finding now is that investors are kind of more willing to take the time to come back to the table and really understand and dig deeper into managers and, and how they're leveraging research and, and what they're doing to try to get the right answer. So, you know, is that truly being used in your risk selection and portfolio management? I think, you know, after the reaction that we as a market have taken, you know, basically by being punched in the face for, for four or five years, you know, and, and hey, there must be something wrong that, you know, investors start thinking, maybe is this industry missing it somehow? They're coming to the realization that, that we have committed a tremendous amount of research and understanding climate. And, and we perhaps are the people that know it and research it more than anyone else. So, you know, they're, they're really coming back, I think, and trying to understand what is it that you're doing rather than just do you guys even have a handle on it? And now they kind of, I think, are trying to appreciate the nuances, um, you know, of, of what's going on. So, you know, for me, it's it's um, it's more of an in-depth discussion rather than, um, you know, just are you paying attention to this at all? So, you know, things may fluctuate in the industry over time, as I mentioned, uh, other issues coming up, but 
you know, the constant will be climate is a huge part of many of the models and regions and perils around the world. And you need to continue to improve even when the industry does get lulled to sleep, like the period of 06 to, to 16, you need to keep up your research to make sure that you're staying on top of changes and implementing it in your, in your pricing. So, uh, you know, a, a longer answer to uh, what's happened on climate, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a bit uh, moved to the side, to be honest, with so much else going on in the market. Mm. Yes, of course, it's such, a, such an interesting time at the moment um, globally financially and geopolitically as well. And obviously that has ramifications for the investor base. So um, it's good to hear that climate remains on the front burner though as well, because it is such an important topic. Um, now moving over to you, Pete, um, perhaps you could explain how you're evolving the education process for the investor base. Um, now you're, you're up more than a year into your research into climate at Elis. Yeah, sure. The process for us really starts with a continuous review of the findings from the climate research community. And there's always new research coming out. We hear about the IPCC is, you know, sort of the predominant news uh, that we hear about the research, but that's really a consolidation of research that's ongoing and something that we need to be looking at all the time. Um, in reviewing that, we try to provide the information back to our investors in what we like to call a multi-dimensional understanding of climate risk. So we want to provide, you know, different facets of the research, but also in different formats that, that make it easy for our investors to kind of consume that. So giving you some examples, one would be white papers, which would be a, a fairly deep technical review, but written for the layperson to read. You mentioned um, part two of our climate research series, that one focused on hurricanes um, just released. We also have a, a schedule down the line to release more in this series, focused in on other perils. Um, so what the white papers try to do is to boil down the science into sort of the most important and the highest confidence findings that we can com communicate back to our investors on a, on a focused topic. Another example would be what we're calling our insight series. Um, these are designed to answer specific questions around ongoing research. A good example of this would be um, the recent volcanic reaction, uh, sorry, volcanic, volcanic eruption that occurred in Tonga in December of last year, kind of um, came over into January. Um, and with that, volcanic eruption, we had a series of questions come in to us around, okay, what are the ramifications of this eruption on um, extreme events? Are, are there influences in the um, introduction of the volcanic ash into the atmosphere on what we might see in the coming hurricane season or the winter storm season? So we kind of consolidate that into that specific question and answer it in a very digestible one to two page write up. So a quick read on sort of a current topic. Um, another example would be our Artis system. Artis was launched last hurricane season. By the way, Artis, A-R-T-I-S stands for ELIS Real-Time Information Service. This is um, a real-time service providing updates on, in the case of hurricanes, the hurricane season as it evolves and then individual events and how they may play out in terms of damage and loss. Um, the artist system right now is focused on hurricane. It'll be relaunched this hurricane season, but we also have plans to expand that service to other perils and other regions. Um, so those are three examples of sort of different formats of information we provide to our clients, um, ranging from sort of real-time climate information to long-term climate ramifications. But the goal really in all of these communications is to address a wide range of important topics. We have to also maintain the right balance of technical detail and provide it in an efficient format so that our investor audience can consume it in a, in a reasonable and digestible way. Mm. That's great to hear. You must be uh, very busy with all of that output as well. And uh, really in interesting to hear that investors are asking questions about sort of real time events that could have an adjacent impact on the space as well, because obviously volcanic eruption risk is rarely a concern somewhere like Fiji for the actual assets themselves, but rightly it could have an implication on the, the whole climate system, I suppose. 
Very, very interesting. Thank you, Pete. Um, so 2021 has been another challenging year for ILS strategies, and we've had some some interesting weather events in 2022 as well, I suppose. Um, but Frank, what are you learning with the climate related research output that you feel can help you in delivering results for your investor base? Yeah, I completely agree. 2021 was was interesting for the almost for the non hurricane side more than anything else. It, Hurricane Ida ultimately is, is so far looking like it's modeled quite well. You know, it, um, you know, deal, uh, say, scene by scene and industry wide. I think the initial picks look pretty reasonable compared to where we think it is today. Um, you know, so more predictable. Uh, nice to have one that doesn't have a lot of yes, but, you know, it, it kind of is, is sorting out the way we think. But, you know, it, it's just another case recently when you think of, you know, Europe, winter storm Uri in Texas and the European floods of, you know, secondary perils, which is a, is a, you know, two words I hear in, in nearly every meeting as well, along with inflation and climate change, um, that aren't attritional. They're really causing occurrence losses deep into towers. So um, I think there's, you know, a couple of different, obviously there's different levels that people play in. There's a lot of players in the market that say, I don't really need to worry about secondary perils. I write, you know, 10 rate online, higher attaching occurrence, Maybe I can scale up my hurricane and earthquake models a touch for it, but you know, kind of realizing that you know there are one in fifty and one in hundred European floods, and you know there are Texas freeze events that can hit uh, high into reinsurance towers and derechos in, in in Iowa, right? So you know I think a key focus on uh, from the climate side on secondary perils and you know not treating them uh, in, in our world and expression as, as noise, you know where you say I'll add a little load in there, and if I'm writing an ag or a quota share, I need to worry about them, but really understanding that. You know, it, it, we talk about one in 50s and one in hundreds and we just throw them out there like they're real tail events and I don't need to worry about it. But if you're getting paid 10 online and you don't pay attention to a one in 50, that's one point of loss online that, you know, is, is chewing away at your profit margin. So, you know, we're we're making sure we don't just look at the hurricane side of things. You know, uh, obviously it's the most important, you know, from an AAL perspective across the model, but, you know, you need robust curves to capture the potential for losses all the way across the spectrum, both at the attritional side uh, and at the, uh, the sort of tail spectrum uh, beyond just hurricanes and earthquakes. So, um, you know, the whole aim of the models is to fill gaps in statistical and historical you know, uh, perspectives that, you know, with a limited data set, we, we can't fill in. So, you know, Pete has built, you know, models like this his whole career, uh, you know, so it's very useful to have him to say, you know, what might we be missing um, to make sure that we're getting the whole span of outcomes. So, you know, all of this is allowing us, I think, you know, our goal in many, most of this is not to say the models are necessarily broken, but how do I take what's good about them and then, you know, make sure I augment them where they need to be, but also figure out, you know, at a granular and regional level, how do I need to tilt them a little bit? So I get a slight competitive advantage versus others that may, you know, write more in an area that um, has a higher exposure than the industry, you know, generally thinks because of, of, of group thinking, accepting the, the, the models, and, you know, and then where can we, where can we go away? So, you know, we can, we can reduce exposure, but we also can grow in an area that maybe we think is uh, mispriced, you know, incorrectly as well. So, you know, our view of risk is always different from the industry. But by having an in-house research function, it really increases our conviction to make decisions and, and have those portfolio tilts and risk selection and portfolio construction, um, which again, will usually be something regional um, or shifts in the long, short relativity of our portfolio more than, a, okay, the, the, the risk is too high or risk is too low across the board. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, research, Pete mentioned the white papers and Pete mentioned the, uh, uh, you know, the real-time service. And those are absolutely critical for educating investors. But ultimately, if it's not changing your risk selection or influencing how you do things, it's just window dressing. So for us, we make sure it, it boils down and gets into our risk catalogs and, and into the expected loss that's produced on an underwriter's desk when they're reviewing a deal. Mm. Yeah, that's the, the absolutely critical thing is to make sure that you're pricing for the risks that you're assuming. And uh, as you as you implied there, the secondary perils for a long time were were awaiting on the pricing. And nowadays, I think they're getting the attention they really deserve these days. And that is down to the, the understanding, the research that people like Pete and his team are uh, performing. Great. So moving on back to you, Pete, um, your latest research paper was around hurricanes and climate change. And perhaps you could give us a bit of an overview of what you did, the research that you undertook and, and also any conclusions that you reached as well. Yeah, sure. The um, the part two of the series 
is as a, as we talked about focused on hurricanes and as frank mentioned you know very important peril but we do have plans to to um, discuss other perils emerging risks such as wildfire um, in in coming editions in this one um, focused in on hurricanes let me try to summarize some of the the takeaways from the paper um, first from an observational point of view it's clear that actual observed hurricanes are confirming that these events are becoming more costly over time. And that that's likely the result of compounding factors. Two of the most important ones being first increased exposure. In other words, more insured property value in harm's way of hurricanes. And secondly, that hurricanes have higher damage potential resulting from warmer ocean temperatures. Now, while the paper does focus on climate change, we mentioned exposure value because it's important to acknowledge that trends in exposure may be as important or perhaps even more important than trends in climate change because they're both factors that play into the overall risk profile. So when we talk about um, the, the exposure itself, it's important to separate trends in exposure over time with trends in climate over time. While they are intrinsically tied together when we assess a major loss event, because we basically tally up the damage, we tally up how much of that damage is insured and how much will be paid out in the way of claims. That's the total insured loss. That is a combination of changes in exposure and changes in the hazard. There are also other economic factors that, that play in as well, such as inflation. Um, another would be escalating labor and materials costs under uh, strained supply chains and labor shortages that often follow major catastrophes. So on the exposure, sort of the economic loss side, it's important to acknowledge that those trends um, ha ha can be extracted from the data and understood alongside the hazard changes. Now on the hazard side, which is the focus, um, we see that advances in climate models and fine scale weather models are allowing us to better understand the relationship of warming oceans, which is the main energy source for hurricanes, uh, to tropical cyclone development. And in turn, that the, the contribution of climate change to overall hurricane risk may be important to consider year over year. Um, whereas we think about climate change changes as being taking place over very long periods of time, we can still kind of consider those changes annually. So in separating the trends and the hazard and the trends and the exposure, we can start to sort of dissect the, the contribution, relative contribution of these factors to the overall risk. Uh, the bottom line really in the paper is that our job at ELIS is to give all of these risk factors proper consideration, climate change being one of them. And so our best practices solution has been developed to account for all of these moving parts in the, in the risk profile. And we've done the, our development without requiring a causal link between man-made global warming, what we call anthropogenic climate change, and natural fluctuations in the climate. So the good news for our investors is now that with an explicit research function, the ELIS view of risk will be evaluated annually and consider the very latest data, the very latest information from the previous season's actual events, and the evolving climate science, which, as I mentioned, the models are really becoming sophisticated, higher resolution, and allow us to get much more insight into the relationship of climate change to hurricane risk. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and as you said, there's so many different things pushing the potential loss of a hurricane higher at the moment. So it's fascinating to hear how um, how your research finds the climate might be sort of playing into that as well. Um, Frank, given this latest uh, set of research that Pete and his team have undertaken, do you think this is going to change the ELIS view of risk at all? Or if not the view, perhaps the way you'll approach analyzing investment opportunities in advance of the coming U.S. wind season? Yes, yeah, I mean, I think re reinforcing what Pete said today, you know, a moment ago, 
the, the speed to delivery that we get with an in-house research function versus waiting for the catastrophe modelers to, to go through and vet everything um, is, is going to make us more nimble and have these portfolio tilts. So, you know, well, the research that Pete, you know, is, 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 is driving, uh, you know, and, and we iterate through constantly um, is, is right absolutely in our portfolio catalog level. So, um, you know, the, you know, down the hall with one of our other modelers right now, there's a uh, sort of a, a loop going on of Pete sending updated catalog, uh, stochastic catalog, the cat modeling team putting together what the impact is on uh, individual deals and the industry uh, as a whole. And, you know, myself and the portfolio team sort of reviewing it and tweaking it and kind of getting to where we want to be. So it's science driven with an overlay of uh, those of us who've been in, in the market for a long time and ultimately will end with, a, you know, a new e-list catalog. And as I mentioned before, we, we've always had a different catalog than ARR and RMS. It sits on the top of those, and you know, this is the foundation. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we've had clustering, uh, serial and temporal clustering for years, and so on. So um, you know, it's going to produce you know something that is a is a, a deviation from the core model. And by definition, then we'll say DLA versus DLB is slightly different. It'll make something look either poorly priced, more poorly priced, or or um, you know, or more attractively priced. Now, obviously, you know, we think there's enough margin built in the system that that doesn't mean you know, what you're not going to hear from us is we're not writing, you know, uh, Georgia, you know, <laughs> uh, we're not writing Louisiana this year. Um, what you would hear possibly from us, uh, you know, is the, you know, the Gulf is is increasing in activity. So we'd like to, to scale down on that or the Northeast. I'm not giving you any uh, actual tilts. That was just an example. Um, but so those type of regional tilts that may steer you a bit away. Um, or we're going to increase our hedge and short portfolios in certain areas um, that we feel like, you know, the Northeast or the, or the Gulf needs to be moved one way or the other in this season, while maintaining the franchise and the, and the deals and what we think are profitable deals, you know, maybe, you know, they're just, a, you know, 10% worse or 10% better. Um, so we want to keep writing them, but we need to offset them a little bit or, or reduce the exposure a bit. So, no, absolutely. It's going to run all the way through. It's going to get um, into, you know, into our decision-making process. Um, you know, and, and additionally, the real-time service, you know, that helps us out during the season. So, you know, we're not really big, um, uh, you know, active ILW or, you know, live event cat trading and so on. However, it can make you some decisions mid-season. So, for example, last year after IDA, there were a lot of ILWs floating around the market saying, you know, maybe now to year end, you want to protect what you have because we've had a, a loss so far. And, you know, the models can tell you, obviously, uh, as of a certain date, what you think the remainder of the year expected loss looks like. Well, with Pete, with Pete here on top of that, we can say, well, what does it look like now? You know, has, has the occurrence of Ida robbed a lot of the latent heat and upwelled and made a situation that we're unlikely to see another storm for a few weeks? And now that analysis we've done makes it look like the loss online is actually slightly lower and the ILW is a poor buy. Should we be selling now? Um, you know, and it may make you execute or, or not execute on a particular trade that's active in the market because you know, we compare this to sort of, um, you know, thinking about statistics, let's say for sports, right? You may say, you know, I'm a baseball guy as, a, as a, uh, an American, 162 games in the season. You may say, this team, I think, will win two thirds of its games, but you're not predicting what will happen in the 42nd game of the season that they'll win or not. Um, once you get to October, you actually have a lot of information that can maybe influence you to do something at the time that may help out your portfolio um, with a small tweak or a small purchase here or there. So those things are actually real time. You have to have strong conviction to do them uh, in the moment, but you know we have more information and with more information it allows us to make some more decisions. So uh, you know, in both the aspects of going into the season with our catalog tilts for that year, and then in season when we actually really know what's going on, and we can read the tea leaves of the next couple of weeks. Um, it really can, you know, give us a you know, competitive edge. We think. Sure. No, that's that's really interesting to hear how you how you use this information for sort of portfolio steering throughout the season, and and also how that can change depending on what's just gone by as well. That's um, fascinating to understand. Um, Pete, moving back to you, you mentioned that you're going to expand some of your research. I guess perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about where and what what areas you might focus on and, and what you see coming next and and maybe also you could tie into that um what what are you seeing in this sort of modeling world that might be coming along that can help in understanding climate related risks 
Sure. Yeah. On the first half of your question, uh, we do have a, a pretty aggressive release schedule planned for our climate research series. We mentioned part two on hurricanes. Um, I mentioned briefly part three planned for wildfire risk, um, but we'll also cover other perils such as winter storms, tornadoes, flood, um, sort of move through the spectrum of perils mm -hmm. and release every few months. These are um, white papers, so they're they're digestible, but they, they take a little bit of time, maybe, you know, 30, 45 minute read um, with some some technical information. So uh, we have that planned out to cover all the all the various perils. Um, I mentioned insights. Those will come kind of on an ad hoc basis as interesting topics come up, say, during hurricane season or during winter storm season. Um, regarding other perils, uh, we we look at really the relation, not sort of just the span of perils, but the relationship between perils is very important in our in our work. And the reason being, it's it's very easy to forget when you're focused in on one peril, such as hurricane risk, that we live in a holistic environmental system. And there are internal feedbacks that connect the development of one region peril combination to another region peril. An example of this most people have heard of the El Nino La Nina cycle. That's actually a cycle of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean, but El Nino La Nina is well known to affect global weather. Um, so when that cycle is happening in the Pacific Ocean, if you're only focused in on the Pacific, then you're going to lose out on, on sort of the information transfer that's happening in the environment between the Pacific Ocean and US winter storm activity or European wind storm activity. So those connections are very, very important. And, and it's sort of part of the, the climate change topic, but it's really part of the climate topic in general and something that we need to stay on top of. Um, one example of this kind of what we call teleconnections or connections between the weather in two different regions um, occurred this past uh, winter in Uri. The, sorry, one winter preceding this winter. Um, and in Uri, there was quite a bit of havoc caused in the Texas region as a result of not what we traditionally think of winter storms as causing, which would be say wind uh, as a hazard, maybe snow loads and ice loads as a hazard, but really the severe cold that was left behind after Uri passed by. And that had impacts not only on property, but on infrastructure, uh, such as the power grid. So there's an example of where, while the state of Texas may not have been prepared um, as they, uh, as other parts of the country are for an extreme cold outbreak, the models actually have accounted for extreme cold as one source of damage in a winter storm. Um, and within the research community, the scientific research community, there is a pressing question around whether these kinds of cold outbreaks into the deep south of the US may actually become more common with climate change, inducing changes in what's called the polar vortex, which is sort of a pool of the coldest air that in the winter season is held in the North Pole, but from time to time, that reservoir of cold air is transported to the south when the jet stream deforms. And that deformation of the jet stream and its connection to the polar vortex uh, may be changing as climate changes. So there's an example where the coldest air that's, that's kind of uh, held in the, in the polar region during the winter season may actually transport all the way closer to the equator closer to the warmer regions of the US in the winter from time to time. Um, so those regions are very far separated, but they're connected via the jet stream, which may be changing in ways that we need to better understand. That example has a direct relationship to winter storm risk. So it's something that we need to pay close attention to. And as that research evolves, we need to understand whether that information can be um, can be incorporated in sort of tweaking or tilting our models as Frank was discussing earlier. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Obviously the jet stream is something that it just feels like we now hear about in our TV weather 
much more frequently than we ever used to a decade or so ago. And, uh, and in the UK here, we've had our share of sort of polar vortex events over the last decade too. So it right. certainly seems like an area that's ripe for research at the moment. And then just asking you to continue a bit, Pete, is there, is there anything you're seeing in the model space that um, gets you excited at the moment? Yeah, well, the direct application of climate change risk to model development is happening in the industry. Um, some of the vendors are coming out with uh, climate change condition models, which look at future climate uh, change scenarios and how they may impact individual perils and regions. Um, so rather than focusing in on what does the climate look like today and how has it evolved from history, looking at a forecast of the future climate um, and with regard to climate change, how that may influence an individual peril or an individual region. Um, that's very innovative because it's a new way of looking at a catastrophe from a perspective of future climate. And it, and it requires um, having some confidence in the climate modeling forecast um, out you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. Um, the good news there is that actually the climate models have become not only more sophisticated, but much higher resolution and can actually resolve individual events such as a hurricane. And that's very promising because if we have any hope of, of um, confidence in a future climate scenario, we need to have confidence in how the climate models are able to depict not only the future climate, but the events that will, that will be contained within the future climate. So that would, that would, I would say, would be one of the most important innovations that we're seeing from the, from the catastrophe modeling perspective. Great. Thank you, Peter. It'd be interesting to hear from you in another six months and see how you're putting that kind of innovation to work within your own research as well. Um, sure. So finally, shifting back to you, Frank, I mean, we're at a point in the year where the ILS market is looking towards the renewal and another US wind season ahead. So it'd be interesting to hear from you how ELIS is positioning to take advantage of opportunities using these learnings from your climate research, but also how you're managing your exposure as well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, we're we're like many others at the moment. Um, you know, our plan is to try to get a, a bit more away from secondary perils. Um, and again, that's not just a, a sort of a, a carte blanche because of their, you know, in the press. It's you know, there, there's just no need to be writing that at the moment. Um, all of these first layer type of uh, structures, you know, they need to be pushed up higher, right? Um, and that's not just from a modeling or a climate change perspective. You know, if you look at a lot of programs out there in the industry, they've had the same attachment point for eight, 10 years, and obviously exposure has grown, uh, and, and that really doesn't make sense. So there's, there are obviously, uh, you know, there, there's market factors at play as well um, with less capital, and, and investors are, are less willing to, you know, jump in for the super high uh, return on capital bottom layers uh, if they think they're going to be taking on attritional losses. So, you know, for us, these are all, uh, you know, we're trying to make sure, as we always have, that we embed um, into our, you know, kind of institutionalize into our process, these perspectives of risk. What we don't want to have happen is, is too much on the underwriter side or, or sort of on the subjective side. I like this risk. I don't like that risk. We want to see everything with the same, you know, the same lens. Um, and by, you know, putting this through a stochastic catalog, what our, our opinion of risk is in the US and Japan and Australia and so on, we therefore drive ourselves naturally towards or away from business you know, that, that um, is attractive to us or we think is, is underpriced or overpriced. So um, I think it's an extension of what, what we'll mostly have said today in that you know, we, we still like our portfolio very much. Um, actually, I like it more and more uh, in the last couple of years as it's uh, continued to improve. The conditions of the market, terms have gotten better, contract wording has gotten better. Uh, you know, and in this year, we're going to influ influence uh, the risk selection with some of these tilts that we've discussed today. Uh, I'm not going to give away what, what they are, but um, you know, they, that'll definitely come to you know come to fruition in in how the portfolio is built, um, driven by the research underlying that Pete's put together. So, you know, one thing I, uh, we we didn't really mention today on um, you know the overall research was. You know, we are working on some academic collaborations uh, on seasonal forecast skill, um, as well as sort of real-time forecasting. We're going to hopefully be announcing those relatively soon. So, you know, what we're trying to do is, is be a good bridge between 
academia, which often produces research, uh, which is interesting and, and scientifically notable, but it doesn't really go to the impact of landfalling hurricanes or how much damage will be caused. It's sort of more theoretical for the whole Atlantic, let's say. So, you know, that's something we're really excited to have come through. And, you know, it's also another nice test of our, um, you know, of our model. So, uh, you know, Pete's working on several, he's visited a lot of schools and, uh, you know, we're gonna be selecting some partners pretty soon. So all of that's coming through um, and is gonna continue to be, you know, part of our investment making decision process this year and going into 2023. That's really good to hear. It's so important that we try and connect academia with the, the, the risk industry, because I think there's a lot to learn both ways, and um, particularly in informing this kind of research too. Um, look, thank you both very much. I really appreciate you sharing some time with us again. And um, that was a fantastic uh, learning for me about how you guys are implementing climate within your decision making too. Um, so I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Pete, and look forward to talking again soon. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve.